sitting a little bit as people uh, mosey on in. Today in the uh, Buddhist tradition, they call it the day of happiness, of joy, because it's the end of the rains retreat. And you know why? Because uh, lay friends usually in India, they come up and they give uh, new robes to the monks. And they give chocolate and, you know, kombucha and stuff like that. And so that's why it's called a joyous day. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> it's also we get to go out of our boundaries. Yay! How many of you three months uh, have felt like you were confined here? Yeah? You were? Yeah. You did not leave the monastery for three months? Yeah? Sometime? Yeah? Wow, that's good. Do you feel like going somewhere tomorrow? Or maybe this afternoon? Like for some gelato or pizza or something? <laughs> Congratulations for uh, all our long term. Uh, our uh, three monthers, yeah. We had about like over 40, 44 or something like that. I forget the number. Uh, lay friends stay here for three months. Some of them had to leave early for a different reason. And so this is a, a graduation day for them. They get uh, one year in the Dharma practice. So as monastic, you know, we, we age by the, uh, the three-month uh, attendance. If you do not attend the three-month retreat, then you don't grow one year in the Dharma. It's like, you know, signing up for university, but you never go to class. Or you go to a few, and then you cheat the rest of it. So it's kind of like that. So in the monastic tradition, the monks and nuns, we... Uh, count by the uh, uh, the number of rains retreat we uh, attend. 90 days. So just think of that. 90 days is uh, one-fourth. Is that one-fourth of the year? So when you become a monk or nun, one-fourth of your life is three months stuck in a monastery. <laughs> It's a, it's a good way to look at it, huh? But of course, uh, we are not closed and like reclusive and like uh, don't want anything. To, we, we still have days of mindfulness and we have interaction. So it's not very like, uh, what do you call it? The cloistered uh, monastery where there's no interaction at all. But just to let you know that uh, today is a uh, joyous day because we've become one year older in the Dharma, meaning that we uh, have touched our, uh, ourselves, come back to ourselves, uh, we're able to be with our suffering, our irritation, our roommates for three months <laughs> without blaming anybody. <laughs> so that's a good way to look at it, you know, to... Uh, have nowhere to run, meaning you have to be with yourself. And with no contact with the news, with no uh, people on the freeway to honk at, you only honk at yourself. <laughs> have a few more minutes. So I take this time to joke around a little bit. We just uh, finished our rains retreat, uh, shining light as well. So part of attending the three months retreat, we uh, we also have the special practice of shining light, meaning feedback uh, from your community. Uh, so all the monks sit together and they share about your practice, how you live in the har in harmony, the depth of your practice, how you. Uh, participate in the activity, the schedule, how you have kept 
your relationship with uh, everyone else and also your service and so on, the different aspect of living in community. You get feedback for, from 30 other people. First, you have to give yourself feedback. You have to do self-shining light. So you have to tell your community what you see uh, as your progress and what has been challenging you. So that's also a benefit of uh, attending the three months retreat. You come out knowing a little bit more, more about yourself and then knowing a little bit more of how people perceive you, which is also a wonderful, uh, beautiful uh, practice to see yourself through the eyes of others. And usually we have a lot of blind spots. And so the brothers, uh, through loving speech and kindness, they share their care and their love for you. And some of it is a little bitter. They're like, ah. And, but every brother that comes up to do Shining Light, they always want uh, bitter stuff. Yeah. And they call compost. Right? And, but the brothers are very kind. They always give like, you know, 10 flowers and one compost. And the brother has to beg, can you give me more compost, please? <laughs> we only give enough so the tree can thrive the next year. You give too much, then the tree will burn. The roots will wilt. Yeah? You ever do planting? You give too much compost, the roots burn, right? So that is the practice. So I just sh uh, share with you, for uh, for you who who know us and who may have. <laughs> what did I tell you? Joyful day. <laughs> thanks, thanks to mommy and Costco. <laughs> I told you it was gonna come up. Kombucha, I knew it was coming. <laughs> That's my mom. She's a Sangha mom now. So let us uh, close our eyes, do a little check in, come back to our breath, come back to our body, and just uh, bring a sense of ease to our mind and the whole of our body. With each breath, we breathe all the way through our lungs to our fingertips and toes, breathing with the entire body. In, I enjoy my in-breath. Out, I enjoy my out-breath.
dear respected Thai, dear uh, spiritual family. Today is the December 18, still in the year 2022. And today is our last day of the Rains Retreat, our closing ceremony for the Rains Retreat. And we are coming from uh, Deer Park Monastery in uh, the Ocean of Peace Meditation Hall in the land uh, it was uh, sharing with coyotes, hawks, all the plants, the sage blooming. You feel them? It is winter, but in Deer Park, it is springtime, mm, the wet season. And all the plants here at Deer Park, they are called uh, opportunists. As soon as there's moisture, they will spring up. So this is the most beautiful time to be in Deer Park in terms of uh, vegetation and um, luscious uh, plants. If you, uh, if you like uh, fungus, moss, and things that grow on rocks, this is a great time. You bring a little magnifying glass and you go hiking up the mountain and you go on your knees and you put the magnifying glass to a bush of moss and you see the whole universe is a, a delight to uh, see you in that scale as well. I learned that from a lay friend here named uh, Georgie. She taught me that. She always has a magnifying glass in her hand, her pocket and her pants and we go hiking she always goes, come here, come here. We get on our knees and you see amazing little flowers that are like smaller than your fingernail. And so this is the beauty of the, this time of year. There's so many things blooming that we don't even see. So when we walk and we hike in the mountain, mm, yeah, be careful of these succulent and mossy plants. They also share this space with us. So today, is, um, I'm going to share for you from the sutra, from the book. I was just recently got shining light, and they say, I don't share any dharma. I, uh, I just joke when I come up here. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm a, I'm a comedian or something, you know? So today, I will take that shining light to heart, and I will share from the sutra <laughs> to make sure that I'm speaking the... Dharma, not to be, uh, what is it, cynical? No, no, uh, sarcastic. It's, uh, it has a purpose. Uh, a, uh, recently, a, a lay friend uh, had consultation with me, and they've been here for a few weeks. It was a while ago, and, and he'd asked me, uh, um, like, uh, what, uh, why did you become a monk? That's like classic question, right? And then like, but the, the other two questions was very good. It was like, what, are, what, what is the benefit? What's the real benefit of becoming a monk? It's great. It's very, very, uh, he wants to know, you know, it's very uh, business oriented. It's like, what is the benefit of becoming a monk? And I think that is a very good question. Because you need to know, like, what is the benefit? But the third question was even better. It's like, you know, how can you be so sure that you can do this for the rest of your life? Isn't that great? I mean, that is really a searcher. He really wants to know what makes me tick and why I'm still a monk. So that... Um, and it actually reminded me of uh, people who are about to get married. You know, young. I had a friend who was uh, kind of hesitant to make the uh, what is it the uh, the vow. I said, God, how do I know she's the one? I mean, there's so many people on this planet. <laughs> I was like, you just gotta do it, you know. Uh, 
Yeah, so it's kind of like the question. It's like, how do you know this is it, you know? And so this is... Uh, and I remember sharing, and, uh, and, and actually a lot of it came from a sutra. And that's why I feel mm, for us to look at and to know and to always keep in mind like where we are in our lives, what is the benefit, the way we are living, to reflect right now, this present moment. You know, what is the nature of our lives and what are the benefits of living the way we live? So it's not just for monastics and monks. And the other question is, how do you know that this is the way. And this is very beautiful because today mm, I'm going to share with you how to know your future. You know, in Buddhism, you know, it's like there's no future. But I'm going to tell you the secret. There's a way to know your future. It's uh, not through your hands and, uh, you know, your face and your tongue and stuff. <laughs> there's some monks and nuns who can actually mm, tell you your future. And when I was little, my mom took me to go see a monk, and he read my palm, and he said, and she told me, he told, he told us that something will happen to you when you hit 30. Can you believe that? And guess what? Ta-da! <laughs> yeah, no, no, don't believe that stuff. That's like superstitious stuff, but uh, my mom is into that stuff. But I had to tell you because, you know, it's like, you know, people, I believe what people believe, you know, so. But today I'm going to share with you that there is a way uh, to look at the present moment and you will see your future. Because in the present, there is also the past and the future. We are who we are now. There is only the present moment, but we also carry how we were raised, our parents, where we come from on a particular part of the planet, the culture, the Asian, the European, the Americans, coming from a certain kind of neighborhood. So we also carry in the present moment our path. And if that is true, how can we also carry the future? And that is where uh, being mindful and being more aware, awake to what is happening in the present moment, you can tell your future. Uh, In the Buddhist Sutra, there's a beautiful image. They say, uh, how do you know this is good or not? And the image they use, the Buddha used, is like, you know, or, uh, or uh, actually uh, uh, an ancestral, t- ancestral teacher, but it never uh, left my, my mind. The image is that you continue to do and the, the tree will lean towards that way, you know. So it's like, kind of like saying in economics, it's, it's the average. In total, living here in the monastery for a year, for five years, for ten years, the wholesomeness will t- lean towards a better future. You see? The other day, uh, Thay Phap Ao and I went somewhere uh, and I hadn't gone out onto the freeway since we've been in the monastery for a while. And uh, actually, it was, he was driving and I was quite, uh, the speed of the freeway, I, you know, it's just, it was uh, new again to me. And I remember sitting uh, in there and, and feeling how, what a dangerous act it is to actually be driving. <laughs> and I told Pop, I was like, God, we are so safe being in the monastery. Because most people have to drive every day to get on the freeway and to make that right, you know, what is it, to get on the freeway? It's dangerous, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but from Ao, he's a great driver. But, you know, I was just experimenting, uh, what is it, sitting there, um, yeah, kind of like, not scared, but like, 
you know, just revisiting how fast we're moving. I actually had an image of actually one of the boats in the car. This is social anxiety, or what is it? Compulsive anxiety disorder. I was like sitting there and I was like, wow, what if a boat in one of those trucks loosen up and then that truck like... (laughs) You know, the miracle that the engine can stay together. Sorry, you know, that's my uh, compulsive disorder, I guess. But it was quite an interesting contemplation to to think of uh, how safe it is just to be here in this environment. Yeah, and a lot of gratitude came up in my heart that we are so uh, lucky to have a a community, to have a a space. Mm. So as I was sharing to uh, uh, this young man, I uh, went back and looked at the sutra, and I want to share with you some of it, not all of it, but some of the, uh, the uh, lines in the sutra. It's very beautiful. And I'm going to rephrase it. Oh, I don't know if you can do that, but uh, I'm going to change the sutra. <laughs> oh, that's not really dharmic, is it? But uh, anyways, it's called the Discourse on Happiness. Yeah, and most of you know this. But like in revisiting it and seeing how you can use this sutra to tell your future is a really cool exercise. So basically, some of you who might not know the sutra, it's, a, it's a, a, called the Discourse on Happiness, and it's about uh, someone coming down and asking uh, the Buddha, like, what is the greatest happiness? How do you live in this world to guarantee that your life is happy? Right? And the Buddha would say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll read it uh, uh, direct so that there's real Dharma here. Many gods and men are eager to know what are the greatest blessings which bring about a peaceful and happy life. Please, dear honored one, will you teach us? So, what is the greatest blessing? Can be translated as like, what is the most like advantageous, what is the most beneficial, what is the bottom line, make guarantee that you will come out profitable. How do you set up your life so you will get the best and most out of it? Isn't that cool? And so uh, the Buddha will go on, and I'll read you what it, uh, how Thay is translated. Like for instance, not to be associated by the foolish one, to live in the company of wise people, honoring those who are worth honoring. This is the greatest happiness. In other words, how do you know your future? Well, if you look at where you're at and you're associated with wonderful people, that's how you know your future. You see that? To not be around foolish and hateful people. That is how you know you lean away from that. So this is another way. So this book has a a fortune-telling sutra. So anytime you're in doubt about your future, you take it out and you read this sutra with that in mind, okay? So that is my uh, gift to you. The oracle book is actually in the Plum Village book, How to Tell Your Future. The second one, to live in a good environment, to have planted good seeds, and to realize that you are on the right path. This is how you know your future. So you can also use this to reflect and shine light on your life now, right? You see that? So some of this might be true, might be somewhat true, might 
be not there yet. But you see how this sutra can you be used as a way of shining light, like what I just shared with you. If you don't have a community, you have this sutra. It's like a mirror for you to reflect where you're at, who you associate with yourself with in the present moment, the way your life is structured now. To have a chance to learn and grow to be skillful in your profession or craft, practicing the precepts and living and loving, practicing the precepts and loving speech. This is how you know you have a beneficial future. So look at your profession. Look at the where you work, how you are in your workplace what you get involved with. So this is, uh, you can tell, the quality and the wholesomeness of your life. I used to work in the profession of architecture. And it's a very competitive environment, very thrash competition. Because, you know, to succeed and to, have, to, get, to make sure you have that job, you have to continue to do good projects and bigger budget projects. So uh, the environment, it was in Los Angeles, and we all want to succeed and become famous architects. So it's quite uh, competitive. Mm. So I remember actually at some point I realized, like, God, why am I so like stingy with my ideas, you know? Like I would protect it to make sure it doesn't go over and someone else knows. <laughs> because that's how you get bigger uh, budget projects uh, is you, you do better. But see the environment and the people you, you your, your, the craft, the profession you're in? Look again. How can we improve that environment so that it is generous, that is selfless, that is helpful, that is uh, giving? So re, this is not to demand others to change, but how do we reset yourself up so that your profession, your craft, doesn't kill your heart. I remember as a young person crying on the freeway. And that's from the urban, they call it the urban angst. You ever heard of that word? Yeah, urban angst. Is that you actually go through the motion of 9 to 5 or 9 to 6, 9 to 7, some of us. And you, uh, you, you adapt to it. And you adapt to it so much that it, it, it empties you spiritually. Because by nature, I'm more like generous and very giving. And I always think of others. But because I have to survive in that environment to, to actually do what you need to do. Because, you know, if you don't compete, you lose your job. Or you get... Uh, lower uh, budgeted, and then, you know, you don't get recognized, you know, the fame, right? So that killed, that killed me as a young person. So this is, uh, you see the reflection? To see, and this is not to uh, say that to change your environment, to change other people, because I also, after meeting Thay in the practice, I came back to my work and saw the human being working with me was my priority. So I would stay late to help another team with their project. You know, stay, and they would ask, why are you helping us? Why are you staying with us? And it's like, ah, it's nice. You guys are cool, you know? So I would stay and help them do the, the drawing, right? Because they had a presentation. Or you find uh, a reason to treat the whole office to pizza or uh, Subway sandwiches. It's like, ah, somebody's birthday today, you know? And so you, you, you counteract the stingy selfishness with generosity. So these are things that you can learn as well. So it's not that you become a victim of your environment or the victim of others, but it's to reflect your profession and to learn the precept and the practice, right? To use loving speech, you see? Those two there, 
practicing the precepts and loving speech, that's exactly why it's next to having a, a skillful profession and loving your craft. When you love what you do and you're generous, selfless, helping others succeed as well, all of a sudden your office becomes like a wonderful uh, place to come to because you know you're working on this relationship. I had a, uh, uh, a secretary, the one who sits in the front office. You know, the, the one at the, I don't know, is it they call secretary? Is that? And everyone avoids when we go in to, you know, uh, we have to go in and then we, everyone avoids her because she will say something and ruin your whole day. Yeah. <laughs> it was really bad. She's like, I don't know what, but it, she had a reputation. And, you know, I remember everyone talks about it. It's like, you know, I don't know. You know? <laughs> and, oh, you know, I didn't understand, you know. And I made it my project after meeting Thai in the practice to get to know her. And then, you know, I would like bring some egg rolls that my mom would make and then bring it to lunch and she wouldn't eat it. Her friend would eat it. But uh, I would buy sandwiches to try to like connect and be nice to her. But she doesn't like people who are obviously trying to be nice to her. And then uh, I met her friend. And we went out to lunch, and her friend told me about her history, how she was abandoned and thrown in the trash can when she was a baby. You know, that changed everything. So there's no more avoiding her. I would go right towards it, and I hear her, uh, okay, good. I won't say her name, but... (laughs) So you see how you can change your environment? And that, what is that? That makes you lean towards a direction. You see your future? How you handle the present moment. Another line is, to be able to serve and support your parents, to cherish your own family, to have a vocation that brings you joy. So these are all reflection. How is our relationship with our loved ones, our family? That's a hard task. And that's why maybe you come here to reconcile, to heal, and then go back and become close to let go of that resentment. This is how you manage and create your future. The more you hold on to these familial uh, knots, you see how that will guarantee a particular kind of future? So how you handle and practice so that you have more understanding and uh, you know, unravel the mental knots that you have towards your family, your loved ones, that will guarantee a light, a uh, unraveling kind of future, uncomplicated future. Oh, how is your family? Oh, it's complicated. People answer the question like that. It's like, how is your family? Oh, well, it's complicated. That means there's like a lot of like, you know, it's like, that's such a weird answer, you know. I can totally understand it. But people practice, they uncomplicate not just your relationship with your family, but you uncomplicate your own uh, internal stuff. Is this helpful? Yes? Okay, good. This is the the Dharma, I think. (laughs) Um, To avoid... I I am sorry, okay? I don't mean that uh, to sound like I'm being sarcastic towards the shining light, but uh, 
It is true. I do stay uh, away from the Dharma, uh, uh, the teaching a lot. I uh, tell stories, and I can see me doing that now. <laughs> um, to avoid unwholesome actions, not caught by alcoholism, alcoholism and drugs, and to be diligent in doing good things. This is how you guarantee a good future. That's kind of obvious. Who's addicted to drugs? I mean, <laughs> you feel that? I am not addicted. Maybe to Tylenol, maybe? You see that relationship? So you must feel a lot of compassion for people who are addicted to not only drugs, but very what perverted a- activities in society. So you see, if your life, that's how you know your future. And it takes courage to actually look at our lives in the present moment, to be honest, to really see where we're at. And this is the power of the practice. With mindfulness, it helps us recognize. And so when we come back more and more to our body, we learn how to be still in our body. We begin to cultivate a kind of mind because body and mind are related. So when you can be still, this is the evolution of what... uh, uh, this, uh, this man in India discovered, or many before him even, from the yogic tradition. First time human beings sat down and just still their body, still their mind. And they began to see how it all works in here. And this is the power, of the potential of our mind to actually recognize what is happening how we are structuring ourselves, how our speech, why does it come out like that? Because you see underneath, we have hidden forces, hidden habits that push us to say that because we have a certain view about ourselves and the other person. You see the knot? And when you're still enough, you begin to see and you begin to know, okay, I don't need to hold on to that. Oh, I know why I hold on to that. And then you learn to take care of yourself. There's an inner child in us that wants so much acknowledgement, acceptance. And it pushes us to do and say things that harm ourselves first and harms other people. So this is where meditation, the the origin of where it comes from in terms of human evolution. I re- just imagine the first, you know, Homo sapiens kind of like, <sighs> I don't need to eat. And they began to see that there's other beautiful things. They first, first, you know, humanoid or how do you call it, homo something, to see a sunset while all their homo mates are like jumping around in trees and rackets, you know. And there was just one homo ape or something. Oh, I don't need to do that. You see the evolution? You see ravens, animals, even squirrels do that. Lizards, I've been on a rock, and a lizard will climb up and enjoy the sun ray with me. And you wonder, like, what's up with that? You're not the only one. I mean, what's the use of sitting on the top of a rock for a lizard? What is useful with that? So unproductive. (laughs) She has that lizard look. Like, yeah. (laughs) 
Yeah, so, so these are some of the things uh, for us to, to look at. Uh, our, how we are setting up our lives, especially in our modern society. Next phrase, to be humble and polite in manner. To be grateful and content with a simple life. Not missing the occasion to learn the Dharma. I would count all of you here. You, you have at least that one down. You're here. You're not missing the occasion to learn the Dharma, I think. <laughs> and are you grateful? Are you content with your simple life? Especially with the uh, uh, shopping season coming up. We, we, the monks and nuns, we do exchange, Santa exchange as well. And now I'm always uh, like just trying to figure out what I can make so that that brother or sister doesn't feel like I didn't really put much energy into it. <laughs> you know, you know, you buy something and they're like, "Oh, that's great!" You know, it's like real wrapping, like real, like you know, was like Amazon box, you know. <laughs> But you make something, you know, like this season, you make something, yeah, for your family, would they be okay with that? Sorry, I'm always promoting that. Uh, uh, to pers- persevere and to be open to change, to have regular contact with monks and nuns. You, this is what it says, okay? I, I didn't make it up. <laughs> <laughs> to, move, to be fully, to fully participate in Dharma discussions. And why is this? Here it doesn't mean it's a Buddhist thing. To be around regular contact with monks and nuns, meaning people who are on the spiritual path. You know, they're just not only concerned about going to shopping and uh, vacation and you know, the next movie and so on. But people who are actually uh, concerned about what, what, what's the purpose of the, all this? Why are we doing this? You know, so people who have a spiritual path, meaning they look more deeply at the purpose and meaning of why we're here. And same thing with Dharma discussion. It's not like, you know, Dhamma discussion like that, but here to reflect about the nature of things, the nature especially of our suffering and our happiness and our peace. To have a dialogue, to learn from others. That is what it means by a Dharma discussion. Do you participate in that? And that guarantees a kind of future because you have time to look at things. And you surround your people, surround yourself with people who also look at things. Isn't that wonderful? That's what Shining Light Session is about. They are there and they're going to go and give you some Dharma and you have to reflect on it. <laughs> Not that it's true, it's perceived, but you know it's helpful. Do you see how this... The, um, is this having effect that you can? Uh, re, are you reflecting on the future, about your future, when I sh- share this? Are you reflecting how you are now, your life, and how it can guarantee a particular leaning? Right? You see that? That is meditation. When we have time to do that. And I have to say, I have to also say, when I first learned it, it's scary to, to actually, and it's painful. So it's not all fan uh, and dandy. What is it? Fine and dandy, fine and dandy. So it's challenging. That's why it also re- requires courage as well as uh, friends to support us, because to look at things sincerely, authentically, sometimes it's very difficult. 
and to be around brothers and sisters and friends and partners who actually are on the path and they understand us sometimes more than we understand ourselves is difficult. Because you, you will resist that out of arrogance and pride. To live with someone who knows you is really hard. Right? Oh, they know what buttons to press. They know what to avoid. They know how to like <laughs> get you. <laughs> but it's even harder to live when you finally realize something about yourself. And so you need support. Yeah, and sometimes that could be a little bit, um, how do you, I don't want to say traumatizing, but like a little scary. It was like that for me. And I finally realized, like, I have to leave this profession. I have to change. My, I can't go back to living like that. It's really hard to let go. It's scary, you know, because we so we want security. We want like a guarantee. And that's what the uh, uh, right security, right? Isn't that huge? Yeah. Right now, make sure you're economically secure because the world is like going down recession right isn't that what they're saying now so everyone is like oh let's uh let's budget things let's make sure uh so you see how our culture creates this false sense of security and the more you do this to like build these kind of like uh you know uh, you know, sandcastle, as I call them. I remember a young person, uh, this kind of sense of false security, because one day, boom, the wave will come in and wash your sandcastle. And however painful it is, you might actually be very liberated. Like, finally, you're not dependent on it anymore. <laughs> and that is uh, very scary. And so this is for me, I share with you my experience. When I first mm, saw that my life is changing, it's both joyful and scary at the same time. Joyful because you're like, oh my God, like the world is open. There's so many possibilities. It's like, and it's scary because you have to let go of all your identity and who you thought you were and what you think it's supposed to be like for you. And you have to let that go. Your friendship, all the things that you value, everything that you hang on to, all these love letters and identity stuff that you put in a box. And you, if you lose that, oh my God. Back then, if you lose your wallet, it's like the end of the world. Now you lose your cell phone, oh my gosh. Like what happens if you lose your cell phone? Oh my God. First thing you do, call your bank. See the, 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 the uh, what is it, entrenchment, the sandcastle? And, and it's scary to look at that. Uh, I remember uh, talking to a, uh, someone that we were wanting to change her life, moving from uh, one country, Holland, and come near Plum Village in France. And I remember uh, she was struggling whether she would want to make that move. And then one summer she came uh, to the upper hamlet and I had tea with her and she had an enlightenment. She, uh, she said, I realize that all my fear of losing my job because then I wouldn't have insurance for my husband and then my daughter and make sure that she's in good school and all these kind of like, you know, the, the, the made it, I've made it kind of a scenario. Like that job for her was guarantee, what do you call it, smooth going for like the next 20, 30 years. She finally realized that actually that was her prison 
from doing what she really loved, which is to be near Plum Village and serve the community. Because Plum Village, there's no security. There's no insurance. There's no uh, guarantee future. <laughs> there's just, that's, that, that's what you get. So it's very scary for her. And I, I tell this story, and I hope I'm not breaching any confidentiality with this. <laughs> But it's a beautiful story because when I heard her share it, it's nothing less than enlightenment. Because you know why? Because she was both scared and happy. And I was like, I know exactly that language. I told her it's exactly what I went through. And whatever is worth it has some risk to it. So this is about the future. Because most of us, we think the future is something very secure, guaranteed, fully, uh, what is it, high numbers, and it's there, and we're going to get there, and it's going to come. The future, that's what, what the Buddha says, not to think about the future. That's what he means. Right? We make an idea about ourselves in the future, and it becomes a burden. We do everything now. We sacrifice the present moment for that illusion. Oh, house with two garage up in that area of the neighborhood. Two cars, solar panel roof. Tenured in the company. I don't know. I don't know what's the new, uh, the new uh, illusion now, but I was in an illusion like that. And so that here, the, 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 the practice to know the future is very based on the present. Okay, this is what amazing what I learned from Thai. You don't uh, have an idea about the future, but you can build your future by how you take care of what is happening now. Isn't that, I mean, that is the secret to everything. And that's why this is a fortune-telling sutra. Oh, I hope that's okay. But do you see how to really look at it? And this really helps me a lot. And so when people ask me, Brother Fabio, how do you know you're going to be a monk forever? I mean, how do you know? Why? And I look, you know, I don't have to drive on the freeway every day. I have many partners, not just one. <laughs> I don't have to own anybody. <laughs> they can't own me. <laughs> anyway, you don't want to get into that one. Because uh, it will... And please don't quit your job or leave your partner, Okay. Uh, this is, uh, uh, you come here to heal, to transform, so that you can have a good partnership and stay in a good profession and be a good citizen. Oh, gosh. That's so <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have just a few more minutes here. Well, anyways, the sutra is there, and please, I introduce for you Discourse on happiness. And to revisit that, we can update it. We can probably add 10 more stanza in there to actually go in detail on how we handle our mind, handle our body as well. That will guarantee the future. Your diet, what you consume, what you watch, the media. Uh, you know, they, uh... So these are also very related to your future, how you take care of your body, and what you put your mind's attention to. If you continue to keep thinking and put your attention to that person and blaming that brother, that sister, oh, they, if only, uh, if only, uh, then that will guarantee a particular kind of future that is not out there, but is the future is in the present moment, in your heart and what you hold. Now Thai is no longer with you physically. 
what's going to happen to Deer Park and Plum Village? You see the answer? You are now a fortune teller. Because you can look at the present moment. Look, Deer Park, what's going to happen to us? You see, now you have the eye. When you look at the present moment, what brings you happiness, how you walk, how you eat your lunch, how you participate, whether you enjoy being in community, or are you calculating? So this is the way to... Now you are a fortune teller. Because now you know how to look at the present moment. And this is beautiful because it's a, a new way of looking at how do you guarantee your future? You guarantee it by how you are building your present. What are you doing today? In an hour, in two hours, how will you be eating? Will you be rushing to finish, to get to your car? and to drive home? You see how we guarantee our future in a particular leaning by the way we rush or don't rush, by the way we anticipate or enjoy the present moment. You see the secret? And this is the gift that the Buddha, Thay, and all the ancestral teachers, why There's so much emphasis on the present moment. That doesn't mean that you don't think about the future. I do think about the future. I do see myself rolling in a wheelchair, still bald, with some teeth, maybe fake teeth, more fake teeth, and being happy. And I know why I'm still happy, even if I cannot walk. Because I know what I enjoy now. You see that? It's so beautiful. So I don't know if this is uh, the right teaching, but you know, usually you say, don't think about the future. And here today, I tell you, you can know your future by the way you look at your life now what you enjoy, what you continue to cultivate. So you enjoy now. You don't know how to cherish it, to reflect on it, to uh, fortify it. It also will become impermanent because the way we have let it become. You see that? So it does have responsibility. The future requires Uh, engagement, uh, um, involvement. You know, the future is not going to come. The future is what you build, what you do with yourself. So in a moment, you will eat and you can tell the future by the way you eat. (laughs) <laughs> it's weird, huh? This is such a cool way of looking at things, you know? Everything you do, you can tell your future. If you rush to get your car to drive home fast, you have just increased your future to lean towards more accident. Isn't that amazing? How you close that door, I can, you're leaning towards yelling at your loved one when you come into the house. You slam the door of your car, and I can tell, potentially an argument is coming. You close the door, lightly, and you're like, okay, it's like some emotion coming in me from work. But because you close it mindfully, you recognize there's some tension in me. So you take a few breaths before you enter your house. And 
when you get to the doorknob, you open, and your loved one, hi, honey, how was your day? I was like, mm, it's not good today. I didn't, uh, it's not good today, honey. Mm, not now. I, I, I need to uh, take a break. I'm having a hard time. You see how your future can be determined by you if you know how to take care of the present moment. Isn't that amazing? And the reason why things go wrong and accidents happen or you say something that is uh, not helpful or mm, cause suffering is, uh, yeah, we're not aware of what is happening in the present moment with ourselves, with our bodies, what's going on with us. And when we're not aware of that, we actually will be pushed to do things and say things that we don't want. That's why the secret, that's why Thai and many of our teachers have emphasized so much to come back to the present moment. Yes, present moment. So I hope that was uh, helpful. Mm. I just want to share that the, I'm also aware that today is uh, at the UN. They are also uh, uh, discussing to have a, uh, mm, a kind of agreement among nations to help protect mo Mother Earth, nature, to kind of biodiversity uh, frame work, like a Paris Peace uh, Paris uh, Agreement for the, uh, uh, the, the climate. This one is for Mother Earth. So I've been keeping that. Uh, it's like the COP conference, but not for climate, but for Mother Earth. And yeah, there's a lot of prayer that, that, you know, that, that they do come to some agreement. They're trying to work out how much Mother Earth nature to, to, uh, to protect and to revitalize. To uh, they call it 30 by 30. So 30 percent, we need to increase how, how many environments in nature that we need. Right now, it's around like 17 percent that are protected. That means you know, you cannot build, you cannot touch it, uh, have nature, have that free place for uh, animals. So they're trying to increase it from 17 percent to 30 percent. And this has informed me a lot because we are building a monk's resident and a brother's hut and, you know, we're trying to look at Deer Park. I mean, are we more than 30%? I think we are. Since we've come here, we have not mm. done more than that. And that's something I just want to raise awareness of and how much um, human, the human uh, animal has uh, kind of taken over our Mother Earth. So just please enjoy the trails after lunch. And uh, yeah, to think of the animals, the plants, the atmosphere, the stream. And, uh, we also need a place for them. So uh, they, their conference will end uh, tomorrow. And uh, I hope they uh, you know, can all agree on that. So you see how it's related to environment and, and, and human uh, happiness? And for our children as well, because many species every year are going in extinct, many forests as well uh, being taken over. So that informs a lot of how we as human beings inhabit this part of the planet, this environment. And uh, so to walk lightly and just know that it's such a blessing to be able to live with uh, animals, plants, and the rocks and the minerals here. So that's something I uh, just want to raise your awareness of. And yeah, look at your own life and how much nature you're bringing into your life, how much nature you're uh, making more of in, uh, in your backyard, in your environment, in your parks, in your sidewalk. Plant more trees. Uh, Allow the insects to crawl around, 
you know, don't make everything so tidy. Keep it like rough because bugs love it. You know, and lizards love it. So the more we tidy up for human comfort and safety, the less the animals and the wild have it. So this is a new consciousness uh, the human species is growing into as we become more aware of our body, our mind, how it works. We become more aware of how community and interrelationship between communities work, between human and other communities. We're becoming more and more aware of the whole ecosystem. This is a beautiful time to be alive through the internet, through the interaction and communication of our human species. It's tough because there's a childish uh, part of us still in humanity, the adolescent, that resists change and responsibility. But it's a great time because you know as any adolescent, they will also grow and mature. And we are part of that. So it's not the government or the other people to blame, but we are part of that. So I just want to end by sharing that. That is a joyous day because more and more we become more aware and conscious that we share this planet and we are this planet. And that it is our responsibility mm, to uh, also uh, make space for other living beings. So I just wanted to share that out for, uh, for Deer Park and all the animals that live here. We had a hundred people stay here for three months, but we forgot to count the four deers. We had four deers come here to uh, Rains Retreat. So I just want to call them out and count them as well. So it's a great happiness. <laughs> Maybe next year we have more deers come. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.